He stretches out the north over the empty place, and hangs the earth upon nothing. Job 26.7 The world also established that it cannot be moved. Psalm 93.1 Why is this subject important? It's important because if the earth stands fixed in the universe, and the sun, moon, and stars revolve around us, there can be no doubt that we stand on the site of God's special creation. Because of this, a great many people throughout history have attempted to remove earth from its special place and re reduce it to one of many bodies hurtling mechanically through outer space. One thing you should think about is the fact that you have, you have always simply accepted that the earth rotates and orbits the sun since before you can even remember. If someone asks you, you'll tell them you believe the earth orbits the sun, but I think everyone knows deep down that it isn't true. You know like you know the sky is blue, that the earth stands still. Go outside on a calm day, look up at the sky, and really ask yourself if you're on a planet spinning a thousand miles per hour and flying through space at over ten times that speed. Now ask yourself why you ever believed that in the first place. What immaculate evidence ever brought you to, to such a fantastic conclusion? In this video, I'm going to cover the following points. Number one, the idea of Earth spinning or revolving around the sun has been promoted since, since ancient times. Number two, the individuals that help gave rise to the modern day theory of heliocentrism were immersed in occult and mystical thinking and even worship of the sun, which influenced their thinking more than scientific experimentation. Number three, Heliocentrism has always been based on philosophical assumptions and not evidence. Number four, actual scientific experimentation has always demonstrated a motionless earth and non-empirical hypothetical models had to be created to try and explain those experiments away. Number five, through media and school systems, people are continuously indoctrinated into the belief that they are on a spinning earth hurtling through space when their observation, experience, and common sense would surely tell them otherwise. Number six, the Bible strongly supports a motionless earth and a geocentric model of the universe. Also, moving ahead, I will be quoting a great deal from Marshall Hall of FixedEarth.com, as well as other writers, so don't assume everything spoken here is my own thoughts. Our story begins in the ancient world. Here we find numerous peoples who worship solar deities. The Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans after them all had deep reverence for the god of the sun, the light bearer, the bringer of wisdom, and that is still worshipped everywhere on earth today. The materialistic mysticism of the ancient Greeks is well known. Like I explored in other videos, these people were inclined to believe that the origins of life in the universe itself arose through swirling particles and blind natural forces. Thus, they had no problems about following strange and unfounded ideas about a moving earth. Pythagoras of the 6th century BC was a major influence in the world of Greek mysticism that followed him. He frequent, frequented the Egyptian city of Heliopolis, the city of the sun. The culture here was ruled by a priesthood and immersed in mystery teachings of sun worship. Hycetus, Ecphantus, and Heraclitus Ponticus were Pythagorean students, and they all advanced some form of either heliocentrism or a rotating earth. Another Pythagorean, Philolaus, 3rd century BC, stated that all the planets, including the sun and earth, revolve around a central fire. Philolaus says that there is fire in the middle at the center. By nature the middle is the first, and around it dance ten divine bodies. The sky, the planets, and the sun, the moon, and the earth. All of them, the fire holds position at the center. Philolaus further advanced ideas about the earth's rotation around an axis. According to Nicholas Copernicus, who we'll talk about later, uh, Philolaus already proposed the earth's revolution in a circular orbit around the sun. And we'll come back to Philolaus a little later and his ideas about a central fire. And then Aristarchus of Samos, 2nd century BC, uh, he was greatly influenced by Philolaus, but identified the central fire with the sun, 
placing it in the center of the universe, with Earth revolving around it. Aristarchus believed the universe to be many times greater than previously thought, and that the stars were also fixed, and that their motions were due to the spinning of the Earth. And Copernicus based a lot of his ideas off Aristarchus, which we'll talk about later. And uh, Seleucus of Seleucia, 2nd century BC, was a Babylonian astronomer, and he strongly supported Aristarchus' model of heliocentrism. And he also ascribed ocean tides to the spinning of the earth. Uh, no records exist of, e of either Aristarchus or Seleucus arguments or evidence for heliocentrism. One would have to ask why these people believed the earth was whirling and flying through space when all physical evidence and observations said otherwise. So after that came Ptolemy and 2nd century BC and he rejected the heliocentric model and constructed a geocentric model with a fixed earth which dominated astronomical thinking until the 16th century. And then we move to Nicholas Copernicus, the 16th century. Most people think Copernicus stumbled upon heliocentrism through his own observations, but actually a couple of his own teachers advanced a sun-centered system or a moving earth. One of his astronomy teachers, Albert Brudzewski, was already said to dislike the geocentric or centered model. Another of his astronomy teachers was Domenico Maria Novara de Ferreira. Ferreira studied under the German astronomer Regio Montanus, who in turn studied the Pythagorean Aristarchus, and is said to have promoted his heliocentric model. So we have both ancient Greeks and Babylonians, and multiple generations of Copernicus' own astronomy teachers, advocating the removal of an Earth-centered model. Copernicus basically borrowed this ancient theory and popularized it, kicking off the, quote, Copernican Revolution. He never provided any evidence for a moving Earth or heliocentrism, and instead based the model entirely on assumptions. Tycho Brahe, in the same time, time as Copernicus, uh, he was a renowned and highly respected astronomer, he rejected the Copernican model of heliocentrism and advanced a geocentric one that became widely accepted for its accuracy and usefulness. Tycho Brahe's geocentric model has never been disproven. The geocentric model is still used today in all the applied sciences, including practical astronomy, space travel, and eclipse predictions. In the last couple years of his life, Tycho formed a partnership with Johannes Kepler, who was a devout heliocentrist. After being suspiciously poisoned to death, all of Tycho's works were conveniently transferred to Kepler due to the partnership. Tycho is even reported to have begged Kepler not to use his work to promote heliocentrism. So, Johannes Kepler, 16th century. He had a religious attachment to a, to a heliocentric universe. He even regarded the sun as, quote, God the Father. It's safe to say Kepler had no problems with seeing Tycho's work on geocentrism flush down the memory hole and forgotten. Two generations before Isaac Newton, Kepler conceived of ideas about gravity, written alongside various lunatic fantasies. He wrote about a group of demons that lived in the shadow of the moon, which could travel to the earth during lunar eclipses. He also believed the moon was covered with alien creatures, Kepler's own mother, who had at one time been charged with 49 counts of witchcraft, was written by Kepler to have constantly communed with the moon. For some reason, Kepler was convinced that the earth was spinning. He reasoned that if he, if he could send people to the moon, they would be able to see the spinning of the earth in real time. He reasoned that the moon demons could carry people there, or that they could be shot out of a high-powered cannon and be sucked into the moon's gravity. In short, Kepler was a straight lunatic and religiously attached to heliocentrism. And this is also where our modern idea of universal gravitation comes from. And then Galileo, he shared a devout faith in heliocentrism that he wrote about privately with Kepler. Galileo became convinced early in life of the truth of the Copernican theory, but did not openly promote his beliefs until later. 
He believed in champion Copernicanism and the belief that the earth was moving without any evidence at all. These people had religious attachments to putting the earth in motion around the sun. None of this was based on evidence at all. And now we move to Isaac Newton. The impact of Newton's gravity hypothesis accelerated greatly the descent of theoretical science into metaphysics and mythology. In his 1687 work, Principia, Newton simply asserted that there was a law of gravitation that would apply anywhere and everywhere in the universe. Despite the fact that Newton knew virtually nothing about any celestial motions outside our so-called solar system. In Sir Isaac Newton and Modern Astronomy, Neville Martin Gwynn writes, quote, From childhood on, you and I have been beguiled into accepting a cosmological card castle for which there is not a shred of common sense or solid proof. The whole post-Copernican kit and caboodle is a rickety structure of assumptions based on extrapolations gained from theories built on postulates distilled from ob observations susceptible to alternate interpretations. It is not scientific. It is not even sane. And yet almost the whole of modern astronomy and the sciences related to it are based on that assumption. In The Life of Isaac Newton, Richard Westfall writes that Newton believed geocentric astronomy accompanied a false religion. Newton referred to the ancient worship of the central fire that was the basis for the Pythagorean Philolaus belief in a moving earth back in ancient Greece. Newton wrote, quote, the rationale of this institution was that the God of nature should be worshipped in a temple that imitates nature, and that the original temple, with the fire in the center, illuminated by seven lamps representing the planets, symbolized the world. Newton even based universal gravitation on this mystical concept of a central fire, writing, The common center of gravity of the earth, the sun, and all the planets is to be esteemed the center of the world. So Newton based his ideas of both gravity and a moving earth on these ancient religions, which he believed accurately represented his god of nature. The bottom line is that Kepler and Newton's ideas about the universe were deeply rooted in mysticism. Why would these guys be so adamant that the earth was moving? Where was their evidence? Where were their experiments? What would cause them to rebel against the whole of experience and observation that informs us that the earth is stable and unmoving. Nobody can prove exactly what these guys were thinking, but it seems obvious to me that they were being influenced by a uh, spirit of confusion. They were certainly practicing some form of nature worship, and the important thing to know is that Satan is a liar and turns things upside down. He is the author of confusion. He wants to invert the truth and distort God's word. This is really no different than evolution where Satan wants us to take the truth of creation and invert it to the point where the creation, or nature itself, becomes the creator. The same way he wants us to take the absolute fixed earth, as proclaimed in the Bible, and turn it into an insignificant wandering planet. The takeaway message here is that these individuals, like Kepler and Newton, that modern academics is based on, were not the hard-nosed scientists that everyone thinks they were, and the popular ideas of heliocentrism and universal gravitation are steeped in mysticism. So after Copernicus, many astronomers, physicists, and scientists staunchly opposed the Copernicus model from the 16th century and up until modern times. Many noted, as some still do today, that there never has been, nor is there now, one piece of evidence in the entire world that conclusively proves the Earth is moving. Though the world believes such proof has been around for centuries and the issue is dead, the inescapable fact is that there was no proof for Copernicanism in the 16th century and there remains none in the 21st century. For centuries after Copernicanism, scientists used experiments to try and detect the motion of the earth, and none were ever able to. These experiments were not taught to any modern students of astronomy or physics. This is from Malcolm Bowden. There was a group of early scientists that decided that their heliocentric pronouncements would be proved and accepted. They conducted various experiments to prove that the Earth moves around the Sun. Unsurprisingly, these experiments failed 
and they knew it. But they covered this information up. In their corrupt minds, heliocentrism had to disprove the Bible, no matter what the cost. So instead of being scientific and accepting that the earth does not move, they decided to hold the truth in unrighteousness. They suppressed the truth like any liar would. False science could not and cannot prove the motion of the earth, because it does not move. Geocentricity. The hidden scientific evidence. The earth is at the center of the universe. We will be examining the results of some experiments concerning astronomy. But before we do so, I would like to present two particular points that will have a huge bearing on all that follows. The first is, what would you think of a university, or indeed the whole university system around the world, that deliberately never mentions to their science students three important experiments, simply because they completely contradict the present accepted orthodox views of our planetary system and astronomy in general? This is what has actually happened. All orthodox models of the planetary system have all the planets circling the sun in an anti-clockwise direction, as seen from our North Pole. And in addition, the Earth is spinning on its axis, also in an anti-clockwise direction. On its orbit around the sun, the Earth travels at 30 kilometers per second through the ether. In 1887, Michelson and Morley carried out an experiment to check the speed of the Earth through the ether. They passed light through two long arms, one in the direction of the Earth's travel, and the other at right angles to it. The light travelling in the direction of the Earth's travel should have taken longer to return than that travelling at right angles to the Earth's direction of travel. To the amazement of the scientific world, no such speed as 30 kilometres per second was detected. But they did get speeds between 1 and 10 kilometres per second. Ignoring these speeds, this experiment is always referred to as giving a null result. This shook the scientific world, and to overcome the implication that the Earth was stationary, they invented the Fitzgerald Lorenz contraction. This claimed that the arm that was in the direction of the Earth's travel became shorter, so that the time to return was the same as in the other arm. There was absolutely no justification for such a solution. It was only invented to overcome the idea that the Earth was stationary in the ether. As Arthur Miller stated, this invention of the Fitzgerald Lorenz contraction was a physics of desperation. So troubling was this to scientists that eventually Einstein produced his relativity theory by which he overcame the problem by simply abolishing the ether. He first said that he did not know of the Michelson-Morley experiment, but later admitted that he produced his theory to overcome the Michelson-Morley result. But abolishing the ether caused many problems with Einstein's relativity theory, which I have exposed in a separate video dealing with this fraudulent theory that is maintained by propaganda. Einstein's biographer commented, the problem that now faced science after the Michelson-Morley null result was considerable, for there seemed to be only three alternatives. The first was that the Earth was standing still, which meant scuttling the whole Copernican theory and was unthinkable. The second was that the ether was carried along by the Earth in its passage through space, a possibility which had already been ruled out to the satisfaction of the scientific community by a number of experiments, notably those of the English astronomer James Bradley. The third solution was that the ether simply did not exist, which to many 19th century scientists was equivalent to scrapping current views of light, electricity and magnetism and starting again. Notice that the last two possibilities are quite different from the first one. The first possibility is rejected not because there was any scientific result that contradicted it. Indeed, it is the only one that fits all the results of the experiments carried out. The other two run into huge experimental problems, requiring much mathematical juggling and sleight-of-hand tricks to come to their defence. The first is rejected because of the purely philosophical horror of having to accept the possibility that the Earth truly is stationary and at the centre of the rotating ether. The Earth really is at the centre of the universe. It is the geocentric model that actually has by far the best support from the scientific results we have been examining and the simplest explanation of them. The Michelson-Morley experiment is the only one of four experiments that is well known. The other three experiments never taught are 1. The Michelson-Gale experiment that showed that the ether was passing across the surface of the Earth once every 24 hours. 2. Aries failure experiment proved that it was the moving starlight carried by the rotating ether that was passing across the stationary Earth. 3. The Sanyak experiment that proved there was an ether, thus demolishing relativity theory. I have made separate videos giving more detailed explanations of the last two. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 states, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Thus the earth was created on the very first day of creation. 
Now, verse 14 says that the stars, sun and moon were not created until the fourth day. This raises the important question. What was the earth circling for three days before the sun was created on the fourth day? Did God have to give the earth a shove to get it moving round the sun? Surely not. He would have no problem in embedding the sun in the already rotating dense ether. So to summarise, the Michelson Morley experiment showed that the Earth was not going round the Sun. The Sanyak experiment showed that the ether did exist, thus demolishing relativity. The Michelson Gale experiment showed that the ether was passing across the Earth's surface once every 24 hours, and Aries failure proved it was the Earth that was stationary and the ether was travelling around us. There are several questions about the geocentric model that need answering, and I have made specific videos on these, such as 1. The orrery demonstrating that the mechanical orrery proves that the relationships between the Earth, Sun, planets and moons are all identical in both the heliocentric and the geocentric models. So you cannot prove either model from just observing the planetary system. 2. Parallax and redshift, all explained in the geocentric model. 3. The brief retrograde motion of Mars, what happens in the geocentric model? 4. The Sanyak experiment, an animated explanation. 5. Aries failure experiment, an animated explanation. It is on this earth, and this earth alone, that God has centred the playing out of the one and only performance of this great drama of the universe. And now enter Einstein. Einstein and company never openly dealt with the question of whether or not the earth was moving. They simply asserted it must be true, and tried to figure out any way they could to demonstrate why no experiments over the last 200 years were showing any evidence of motion. Einstein's relativity has no meaning whatsoever if the Earth is stationary. Thus it is clear that the hidden but real purpose and thrust of Einstein's life's work was to advance a theory that would nail down the belief that there is not and cannot be anything at rest in the universe. If this concept could be made triumphant in the science establishment, then it would filter down through the education system of scientific knowledge. Thus the concept of a moving earth would never become threatened again, but would subtly become a scientific fact without anyone ever discussing whether it moves or not. If nothing can be at rest in the universe, then the earth must be moving. Implanting this concept as a means of forever preventing a return to Bible geocentricity is the true and only real purpose of relativity theory. All the fancy footwork involving invented mathematics, new definitions for time and distance, arbitrary absolutes, thought experiments instead of real experiments, etc., was just an intellectual smokescreen designed to keep anybody from noticing the true and only purpose which, to repeat, was to bury forever the non-moving earth taught in the Bible. And this is from Marshall Hall. Einstein's basic input into the world of ideas was this. There is no absolute truth about motions of the heavenly bodies, because all motion is relative to the location and perception of the viewer. This big idea that there is no absolute truth quickly spilled over into all other areas of man's knowledge and learning. Truth was now whatever you, the observer, want to make it. Though the fact that the Michelson-Morley experiments, and all others, demonstrated a motionless Earth, such a conclusion could not even be considered by the leading scientists of the day. Rather, any way out, however perverse, illogical, and just plain crazy it might be, was the object of their frantic search during those years, and the reason for the worshipful praise showered upon Einstein's theory of relativity. However, the most important point is this. Einstein's special theory of relativity, in no way, shape, or form, proved that the Earth was moving. This monumental farce has all but given the coup de grace to mankind's God-given ability to reason logically and to insist that known facts take precedence over unverifiable hypotheses which contradict them. And these are some videos on falsifying Einstein and the experiments that the space program tried to use to prove relativity.
in this series of videos, I'm going to be talking to you about why Einstein was wrong. Uh, and I'm not going to be presenting my own theories here. I'm not going to be pulling crackpot theories from the internet. Uh, everything that I'm going to tell you today comes from well-established science, from peer-reviewed journal articles, from scientists working in the fields of plasma, uh, high-energy plasma physics, uh, electrical engineering, uh, astronomy, and cosmology. Uh, these findings are well-known. You can Google them yourselves on the internet to uh, research them further, and I encourage you to do that. Um, but I'm going to basically give you a point-by-point -point breakdown of observational evidence that falsifies Einstein's theories. These points are well-known, as I stated earlier. The first point I'm going to cover here is something called frame dragging. Frame dragging refers to as that as a spinning body moves in orbit around uh, the Earth in space, say a satellite, it should, uh, according to Einstein's theories, drag space around it as it's rotating. Uh, this effect is called frame dragging. And in fact, many satellites have attempted to look for this effect of frame dragging predicted by Einstein's version of relativity, the most famous of which was a satellite called Gravity Probe B. Gravity Probe B had very sophisticated, very sensitive uh, floating gyroscopes uh, within it that could detect this anomalous frame dragging, supposedly. Uh, Gravity Probe B, I believe, cost uh, nearly a billion dollars of taxpayers' money uh, to put up and fund and, and, and for the research program, the research side of it, that eventually looked at the numbers. And as, as I said earlier, numerous satellites had attempted to look for this uh, before Gravity Probe B, and all of them turned up null results. Gravity Probe B itself turned up a null result. When the final research was finished, uh, when, when the data was uh, accumulated from the satellite, when scientists looked at the data, the raw data uh, showed no evidence of any frame dragging whatsoever. Uh, the scientists hashed and rehashed and rehashed the data over and over and over again. They still could not find any evidence of frame dragging. And finally, what they did was uh, they washed the data through uh, a model to remove supposed static buildup errors from the gyroscope readings. So what the scientists said had happened was that uh, as these gyroscopes were spinning around in space, there was static buildup in certain portions of these gyros. This is what caused the null result. So they created a hypothetical model to remove the supposed static error from these readings, and lo and behold, they produced results of frame dragging. Well, obviously, this isn't any real proof at all. The raw data still says there was no frame dragging, and because you're washing the data through a hypothetical model, the results themselves will be hypothetical. Uh, it was pretty much a huge embarrassment for NASA. We were talking a billion dollars of taxpayer funding essentially wasted, uh, showing that there is no frame dragging. Uh, no, no satellite has proven it, and no satellite ever will prove it, because frame dragging is simply a fallacy of physics. The next item on my agenda is something called the LIGO. The LIGO is a laser interferometer that supposedly is out there to observe gravitational waves. It's a gravitational wave observatory. And uh, what Einstein's relativity predicts is that you may have these black holes or pulsars out there spinning around, and because they're so dense and so massive, uh, as they're moving around and spinning around and doing their thing, they create waves of gravity. And the purpose of the LIGO, this thing was supposed to be a gravitational wave observatory, and scientists had huge expectations for it, and this was going to bring in a new way to study the universe. It was going to be the Hubble telescope of uh, gravitational waves. But what turns out that LIGO, in all of its years of operation, has never detected a gravitational wave once. Not ever, ever. That is because gravitational waves don't exist. They're a fallacy of physics. They can't occur. And any rational person, person thinking about it would come to the same conclusion, that you can't bend nothing and expect nothing to impart force on something, which is what Einstein's relativity revolves around. So here we have two primary obs falsifying observations of Einstein's theory of relativity. These are predicted values uh, that did not turn out the way they should have. And scientists know full well that the, these, uh, that these uh, the satellite and the, and the LIGO failing is basically direct primary falsifying evidence of Einstein's version of relativity. Uh, we move for, further, we, I mean, I'm not done yet, we're, we're just getting warmed up here. <laughs> we have something called the CDMS project. The CDMS project is supposedly a dark matter observatory. The scientists take their gravitational models of the galaxy. Uh, when they model galaxies, and when they look out at the stars and, and they see, they count up how many stars they can visibly observe, and then they take that against other models of how galaxies form. It turns out that there's not enough matter in the, a galaxy in order for it to hold together the way it's observed in space. So they assume, they make the assumption that there must be additional matter within the galaxy in order to make it hold together the way they know it they know it should, according to Einstein's version of relativity. And they call this matter, this missing matter of galaxies that holds galaxies together and causes them to spin around. They call this matter dark matter. The, CDM, the CDMS project was set up and designed to detect this dark matter according to predictions made by the theory of special and general relativity. 
So has the CDMS project, which costs tens of millions of dollars itself, detected any dark matter? No. Uh, so here again, we have direct falsifying observational evidence of Einstein's theories of relativity. Uh, there has been no, no, in no research program ever has, has ever detected direct observational evidence of dark matter. No research program ever has ever detected observational evidence of gravitational waves. No research program ever has ever detected the direct observational evidence of frame dragging. So we have three clear failures of Einstein's theory of relativity. And these are huge. I mean, we're talking uh, this, this dark matter here. Uh, without, without scientists postulating that dark matter exists, if, if they can't prove that dark matter actually exists, uh, then all the theories of how galaxies form and how space expands are all wrong. It's all made up. There's, there's not one thing would be right about Einstein's version of relativity if dark matter didn't actually exist. Well, all the evidence shows that dark matter does not exist. But let's keep going here. Today, contrary to the public knowledge, heliocentrism is still based entirely on assumptions. It must be assumed that the sun is stationary. It must be assumed that the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles per hour. It must be assumed that the Earth is orbiting the sun annually at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour. It must be assumed that the Earth is tilted on an axis of 23 and a half degrees. It must be assumed that the Earth's atmosphere is also rotating at a thousand miles per hour, keeping birds, clouds, jets, and low orbit satellites in perfect synchronization. It must be assumed that the stars do not move around the Earth, as they have been observed to do by everyone who has ever lived in all of history. It must be assumed that the reason the, Earth, the Earth's diametric orbit of 300 million kilometers does not produce any noticeable stellar parallax is because the stars are too many trillions of miles away. If just one of these assumptions are false, then the entire heliocentric model falls apart and not one of them has ever been proven. Nobody has ever proven that the Earth is spinning. Nobody has ever used verifiable facts to prove any of these things. In today's culture, from the moment children are old enough to absorb information, they are inundated with imagery of heliocentrism and the solar system. From, in from infancy, we are made to absorb the idea that heliocentrism is as self-evident as the Pacific Ocean. We are raised up into science fiction Star Trek worlds where galaxies are infinite and there is no center to any of it. We are continually reinforced with the idea that Earth is just another planet out of trillions, hurtling meaninglessly through outer space. By the time we are adults, this idea has been so thoroughly hammered into our brains that to, that to even hint that we may stand on a motionless Earth is considered absolutely insane. The simple truth that our senses inform us have all but been censored. Nobody is told that there is a geocentric model that has been working just as well since the 16th century. Nobody is told that the use of a heliocentric model has been based on philosophical assertions that Earth could not possibly be the center of the universe. However, it is readily admitted by modern day astronomers that there is no real difference between a helio and geocentric model. Astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle states, quote, We know that the difference between a heliocentric theory and a geocentric theory is one of relative motion only, and that such a difference has no physical significance. Today we cannot say that the Copernican theory is right and a geocentric theory is wrong in any meaningful sense. The two theories are physically equivalent to one another. Astronomer Gerardus Bowe states, It has been shown at least six different ways this century alone that the equations and physics used by NASA to launch satellites are identical to equations derived from a geocentric universe. Cosmologist George Ellis states, I can construct you a spherically symmetrical universe with Earth at its center, and you cannot disprove it based on observations you can only exclude it on philosophical grounds. The fact is we are using philosophical criteria in choosing our models. A lot of cosmology tries to hide that. And this is more from Marshall Hall of FixedEarth.com. Here's the bottom line with Copernicism, or heliocentrism. 
It is nothing but flaws. Like evolutionism, there is not one true thing about it. Every claim that it makes rests on an assumption that violates an observable fact. No one has ever observed the earth moving. No one. No test or space shot or anything else has ever shown it to move. None of them. We believe the earth moves because there has been over 400 years of satanically motivated, increasingly sophisticated indoctrination coming forth from the science establishment telling us that it moves. No one has ever, ever, ever seen or felt the earth moving at any speed. No one has ever seen the sun do anything but rise, go westward across the sky, and set. No one has ever seen the moon go eastward as it must in the Copernican system. It always rises in the east like the sun, goes westward, and sets in the west. We believe otherwise because we've been taught otherwise. Just like people throughout history have believed all kinds of deceptions and called them truths. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The public has trusted the physicists, trusted them perhaps more than any other group. But in time, people will learn that the physicists are no more immune to the perverse motivational currents of the times than any other professional people. Scientists have enormous vested interests in protect, protecting their theories, and the lazy, servile adherence of many physicists to pompous, conventional dogma makes them leaders in the downward trend of civilization. For 72 years, humanity has been browbeaten by an incomparably brazen bit of pseudoscience, Einsteinism. Because its perpetrators have defended it by using mathematics, which, though valid in itself, is not applied in relation to objective facts that are analyzed logically in the real world. Recondite kinds of higher mathematics have been falsely used to create an awesome, esoteric language whereby the initiated elite have set themselves apart from the world and have labeled all dissenters as quacks. Censorship is in total control of all areas of knowledge. All the natural sciences, all the social sciences, all the arts and humanities. Everything about which a man has knowledge has been stood on its head in order to contradict the real objective facts that are analyzed logically in the real world. The real facts, the real logic, the real world, which confirm a creator, not the counterfeit facts, the counterfeit logic, designed to promote meaningless, accidental, purposelessness, explosions of matter. If we use our brains for one minute, we know that a million kinds of eyes and brains and reproductive systems and all the foods and roots and flowers, etc., etc., could never form out of an explosion of matter. We know it. And when we use our brains for one minute, we know that the earth cannot be traveling through space at 30 times the speed of a rifle bullet. We know it. When we use our brains for one minute, we know that mankind has been deceived by false science using crazy mathematics into denying the creation of God. That is right before our eyes, exactly as it is set forth in the Bible. Virtually the whole world has professed itself to be wise, but has become fools. Worshipping matter as your creator is a false idol, and it will be destroyed with every other false god. There are 67 Bible verses that point to either a fixed, stationary earth or a moving sun. There are zero verses which allude to a moving earth. These are all listed at fixedearth.com. Just by looking at Genesis, it is clear that the earth was specially formed first, and the other stars, including the sun, were created afterwards. There is no mention of earth being put into motion, and the Bible explicitly states that the earth cannot be moved. When I first began considering a stationary earth, it seemed like an outrageous idea. And then I realized it's exactly what I've known to be true my entire life. 